Good evening and welcome to Combating Hate and Extremism Online, hosted by the Georgetown Institute of Politics and Public Service, known to many of you as GU Politics. My name is Jenny Patterson and I'm graduating next month with a Master of Public Policy degree from the McCourt School. I worked with GU Politics a lot during my time at McCourt. Two of my most notable experiences were planning a dinner discussion event on gender bias in politics with former and current GU Politics fellows. And last summer, I started as a student lead during the Institute's legislative internship training. Tonight, we are joined by three amazing panelists to provide their expertise on the topic. Margaret Wang, a 1991 graduate of the School of Foreign Service, is a president and CEO of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Previously, she served as the executive director of Amnesty International USA. Jonathan Greenblatt is the CEO and national director of the Anti-Defamation League. Prior to this role, he served in the Obama White House as the director of the Office of Social Innovation. Issy Lepowski is a senior reporter at Protocol, covering the intersection of technology, politics, and national affairs. Previously, she was a senior writer at Wired, where she covered the 2016 election and the Facebook beat in its aftermath. The conversation will be moderated by Moe Lathy, Executive Director of the Institute of Politics and Public Service. Please join in the conversation by tagging at geopolitics and using the hashtag geopoliticsforum on social media. Mo, over to you. Jenny, thanks so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for all of your leadership at geopolitics throughout your time and congratulations on your, uh, and early congratulations on your upcoming graduation. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining us this evening. I'm um, uh, really looking forward to this very timely conversation with three individuals who um, I just have a tremendous amount of respect for. Jonathan and I have known each other now for several years. We met a few years back at, at a retreat and became fast friends. Uh, and I've been trying to get him to come do uh, a conversation with us ever since. I'm glad it finally worked out. Margaret um, uh, and I, uh, I'm not sure she knows this, we overlapped as undergrads at uh, the School of Foreign Service for, I think, a year or so. Um, so it's always good to welcome you back uh, to Georgetown. And Issy um, and I first spoke a few years ago when she was over at Wired Magazine covering an initiative we were working on. And since then, we keep tapping her to come and participate in some of these panels. Um, there are a few journalists out there that know the tech uh, beat as well as as well as she does. So um, thank uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, the four of us are going to talk for about the first half of the conversation. And then we're going to open it up to bring in um, questions from those of you here uh, in the Zoom room. Um, for those of you, members of the Georgetown community that uh, are on Zoom, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A tab. Click on that um, to submit your question. And when the time comes, someone from our team will let you know um, that your question was selected. You'll then be brought up on screen. So as we like to say, make sure you are camera ready uh, for, your, for your big moment to ask your question. Um, and so with that, let's jump into the conversation. Um, look, hate's not a new thing. Um, groups like ADL, like SPLC, have been around for a long, long time, uh, unfortunately, uh, tackling uh, some of these issues. But it feels, as just a consumer of information and, and the news, it feels like it's getting worse. It feels like over the past few years, there's a rise um, in hate speech, in acts of violence, whether we're talking about the rise of anti-Semitic uh, acts, whether we're talking about what happened in Charlottesville a few years ago, um, whether we're talking about um, the insurrection on January 6th, or the rise in uh, hate crimes against Asian Americans, um, and so many others. Um, it feels like things in recent years have gotten much worse. And so I want to keep this conversation broad and give us as much room to maneuver here. And so, Margaret, let me start with you and then maybe go to Jonathan and talk about, you know, am I right? 
is it getting worse? And, and maybe talk a little bit about why. It's a tough question to answer, though, because there are all kinds of ways that we measure the scope and scale of hate and extremism in the country. And some signals are that, yes, it has clearly gotten worse. I think those incidents that you referred to in your introductory comments demonstrate that it's become much more into the public mainstream discussion about what's happening in the country. But it's hard to gather actual numbers on adherence of hateful ideology or um, the potential threats that they pose. Just to give you a little background, the Southern Poverty Law Center actually began tracking hate groups in the 1980s. It was part of our litigation strategy. We were suing the Ku Klux Klan, and we wanted to know how do the KKK groups recruit members? Uh, how do they promote activities? What is, their, what is their daily activity like? And so we created a group called Klan Watch to start monitoring these groups. And over the last 30 years, our efforts have expanded quite significantly. In fact, the KKK is amongst the smallest number of groups on our growing hate and extremism list. So today we're monitoring a number of different groups uh, ranging in, across several different ideologies, including anti-immigrant, uh, anti-LGBTQ, anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic, uh, as well as white supremacist and white nationalist groups, um, which have gotten, I think, the most attention after January 6th. So the fact that there are so many groups that are active today would be a signal. And and yet, in time, we mean that there are there have been active groups doing white supremacist and extremist uh, hate promotion for decades. So it'd be hard to tell you if it was actually significantly larger or just simply more savvy about promoting it, uh, the the narrative that they've adopted in the public mainstream coverage. Jonathan, I know ADL um, also. Uh, monitors and tracks these groups. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit. It, it seems to me, again, I, I'm not an expert in this, but that the role of social media and the digital world we live in has made it so much easier for a lot of these groups and and you know, I hesitate to call them movements, but you know, to to organize and to communicate and to to get people. Um, and to mobilize. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that part of it. Sure. Well, so first of all, let me just thank you, Mo, for the opportunity to be here with you and at this platform hosted by Georgetown with, with Margaret and Issy. And I have tremendous respect for Issy's writing, and, but really, in particular, extraordinary respect for the work of SPLC, which is just super important in terms of the monitoring and their plan watch and hate watch. And the hate groups list is really quite seminal work that all of us in the field benefit from. Um, so let me, I'm going to respond a little bit to your first question, if I might, and then dive into the second question. To the fir first question, um, look, I think we know that hate crimes are chronically underreported in the United States. This is a perennial problem. M well over 80% of municipalities either report zero um, or don't report at all hate crimes, which we know does not reflect the reality on the ground. That being said, we do know that according to the FBI stats, hate crimes have increased in recent years. Uh, we've seen spikes against different kind of marginalized communities. But if we just look at the data that we have, we know that they are increasing though. At the ADL, we track that and we pay particular attention to anti-Semitic incidents. And I can tell you after a 15 year decline, starting in 2016, we watched anti-Semitic incidents spike they increased in 2016, 34%. They went up in 2017, a whopping 57%, the largest single year increase we ever saw. In 2018, while it dipped some 5%, the number of assaults more than doubled year over year, and that was the year of the shooting in Pittsburgh. And in 2019, we, we tracked a record number of anti-Semitic incidents, the highest number we've seen in 40 years of doing this work. And we're about to release our 2020 stats and I can tell you it's the, the numbers aren't good. So, and then just uh, last month, we released our annual report of white supremacist propaganda, right? We track white supremacist propaganda incidents. Those 
those just about doubled from 2019 to 2020. So 2020 saw a 90 plus percent spike. So just incidents on the ground, Mo. And by the way, the, we also released a report in January of extremist related murders, which also increased. So it looks like to us, I mean, we have 25 offices across the country, we're a very retail organization. We see increases which are very alarming and indicate a change in norms in many ways, which is ironic because our country, it has, you know, it's more pluralistic than any in the world. And if you talk to young people today, their respect for people from different marginalized communities is higher than preceding generations, but there are a large incidence of, of uh, crimes and, and things that may be less than crimes, but still very troubling. So why is it happening? Well, specifically, I will just note, there are a bunch of factors, but to your question, social media has really been a super spreader of bigotry. And in part, it's because the platforms, I think, have built these Frankenstein monsters, which have mutated in ways that they couldn't have initially predicted. I can say as a former product manager from Silicon Valley myself, the products weren't designed. They weren't literally in their DNA. Nobody put into the code protections, if you will. It was break, you know, move fast and break things. It wasn't move fast and make sure people are protected. So that has created the conditions in which these things have spun out of control. I think thirdly, the companies are shielded from liability because of some policy issues we can talk about, which has decreased. I mean, they feel like they're not responsible the way traditional media companies feel because legally they're not. And then finally, um, there's a kind of libertarianism in the Valley, which I think is very self-serving in some respects, but it's anything goes sort of free speech more than anything else. And, you know, I think sometimes the CEOs and I think about Mark Zuckerberg's speech at Georgetown, which we can talk about, but the companies forget that freedom of speech isn't the freedom to slander people and freedom of expression shouldn't be the freedom to incite violence. And they've, yeah, but they've kind of taken the first amendment to an extreme beyond what the founding fathers had in mind, beyond what the Supreme Court recognizes. And that libertarianism now is something we're all dealing with. And that's very alarming. So is the, you know, Jonathan just referenced the Zuckerberg speech at our Institute a couple of years ago. Um, where, you know, he came out and spoke about the importance of free speech uh, uh, online and made the argument that um, it was not the platform's role, specifically Facebook, not their role to regulate speech. Um, my sense is that there's some tension amongst the platforms about how to address some of these issues. Um, but one thing that I kind of get the sense is universal is they're not real. None of them are really sure how to address this issue beyond going so far as to um, try to pull down some of the most incendiary, hateful, gross content that's out there. So I'm wondering if maybe you can give us your perspective as someone that follows uh, the companies, the tech companies closely. What is the 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 thinking there about the best ways to address hate online. Right. Well, you're definitely correct in that none of them has figured this out. This is definitely a, a work in progress and um, maybe they're not making as much progress as they should. And I think Jonathan made a really good point in that he was saying that, you know, these companies were not built for the purposes of caution. They were built to as he said, move fast and break things, as Mark Zuckerberg said. Um, and then the problem is that once things started getting broken, then the process of fixing it has been very methodical and thoughtful and slow, and in some cases tortured, as they try to justify the policies that they have written. And these policies are carefully written. I think a really big misconception about these companies is that, though, oh, they're just flying by the seat of their pants, they have no rules, sometimes they'll take this down. Sometimes they'll take that down. I think that is a little unfair. These are long, wordy, extensive, granular policies. The problem is that these platforms are just so large. And so those policies aren't always enforced you know, the way they should be. They aren't always enforced the way we, the public, believe they should be. Um, sometimes the companies have a different interpretation of their policies than we do when we are reading them, or maybe than their content moderators do. And so they run into 
all of these issues around public perception, around their own socio-political needs. Maybe the policy says one thing, but oh, if we can find a loophole to say that we shouldn't take down that that offensive Trump post, um, then we're going to use that and we're going to defend our decision um, against our policies. And so these are some of the issues, right? They're constantly evolving those policies, but they're doing so in a much, much slower manner than they unleashed these technologies on the world and, and in some ways uh, exacerbated some of these problems to begin with. And so I'm just going to throw out some questions and like anyone can just jump in here, but I mean, isn't this sort of like a game of whack-a-mole in many ways? I mean, particularly the online piece of this, you know, we put pressure on one company to, to crack down. We put pressure on Twitter, we put pressure on Facebook, and then they just move to another platform or start another platform. You know, Parler became hot for a minute until there was pressure to shut that down and then something else is, is, may pop up. So I guess part of my question here is, it, as we think about how to combat hate online, like, is it, can we? You know, it, it, part of this gets to why there is an increase just generally of hate crimes. But is there, is it even possible to tackle this issue at scale in one of the most, you know, democratized, um, you know, uh, um, institutions that we've ever seen in the internet? My, my instinct is that you're not going to see all hate speech disappear from the internet just as you wouldn't see it disappear from the real world. The challenge is, and Mo, you talked about, you know, people moving on to parlor if they're kicked off of Facebook. The challenge is uh, Facebook is, benefits from these, what they call network effects, right? So if 3 billion people are on Facebook, that means that not only will the diehard hate mon mongers stumble upon this content, but so will you know the, the people who are hate curious or, or maybe susceptible to manipulation. Um, and so you end up bringing in a whole lot of people who maybe wouldn't fall victim to these these ugly um, mindsets and, and perpetuate them where you move when you move on to a platform like parlor that is self-selecting and it's going to reduce the audience that is exposed to that content not to say that's not still definitely a problem and and can be dangerous and needs to be monitored carefully but you at least limit um, you at least limit the potential audience. I think that's a great point, Issy, and it, it's something we've been talking about a lot. We're actually really supportive of the idea of deplatforming people who are using these mainstream social media platforms to promote these ideologies. And so it matters when you take uh, people who are known for hateful rhetoric off of those platforms, because as Issy said, then, then their audience is in immediately shrunk. They're only talking to other people probably very like-minded people, there is a risk that the potential for violence escalates when you have a smaller group of people who are all very, you know, very intent and very keen on the same things. We could see a, a greater tendency to escalate violence, but it, but it does limit the number of participants. And I think January 6th is kind of a great example of this. The insurrection on January 6th was organized on Twitter. Yes, there were a lot of groups also doing organizing and planning on other platforms, but the reason so many people came to Washington for the rally and for the assault on the Capitol is because it was posted very widely to a wide ranging group of people, some of whom did not have any associations with hate and extremist groups. So I, I think that's a really key factor is thinking about the, the intended audience under each of those platforms. And you're absolutely right. We're, we're never going to get rid of all of it, but we do have ways of limiting the scope of, of the reach. Yeah, I, I think I think both Issy and, and Margaret covered it. The only thing I would add is, you know, um, so it, my friend Steve Hoffman at Reddit, he's, he's used this phrase. I think it's smart. He says there's always been a fringe. We just need to keep it on the fringe, right? So today, whereas 30 years ago, you know, they used mimeographed newsletters that were hard to find. You had to go to a compound in Idaho before, you know, our predecessors at SPLC and ADL bankrupted them in court uh, to go find these people. 
like today, you know, your, your, your nine-year-old can find them on YouTube, literally, or on TikTok or on other platforms. Like that's unacceptable. There's a reason why you don't have white supremacist programs in primetime television. I mean, because the companies, again, some of it is the liability and the other kind of checks and balances in, in media companies, they don't allow it. Now, I'm certainly not going to justify Tucker Carlson, who gets, who's kind of like, I had never heard of the term hate curious before. I would say he's pretty much hate adjacent, if you will, with a lot of the stuff that he says. But um, to be perfectly blunt, like it is unacceptable that the companies have mainstreamed this kind of tox toxicity. And they really have. And that has got to change, Mo. It's not that they don't deserve a place to talk. But when we elevate them to the equivalent of prime time online, everybody suffers from that. It, 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 it normalizes what they do in ways that should never happen uh, in society. As a parent, it terrifies me, right? I mean, you were just talking about this, Jonathan. Because it seems to me that a lot of these groups have gotten very, very sophisticated in how they use a lot of these platforms. Um, and so while they have unique in, uh, ways of communicating amongst themselves, they've also gotten very adept at sort of putting a lot of their, masking a lot of their, uh, their stuff so for a more casual observer to just kind of stumble across or, um, uh, you know, you don't know maybe that you're seeing something from the Proud Boys, but, you know, they're, dra they're drawing people in. A lot of the people at the insurrection weren't somehow affiliated in any formal way. They weren't organized mm -hmm. by one of these mm -hmm. groups knowingly, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they were, they were close enough that they were able to get dragged in. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that, I mean, I guess that kind of brings me to the bigger question about, you know, for a long time, like if you remember the clan, you're going to clan meetings, you're wearing, right. Like you, 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 it was easily identifiable. A lot of this stuff isn't so easily identifiable now. So how do we guard against it? Well, I, I would just say that I think, you know, we talk about ADL, what I, a phenomenon we call the normalization of extremism. <laughs> right? The normalization of extremism. Like as Margaret said, and as you alluded to, when the attack comes on the Capitol, there were tens of thousands of people on the mall, the large majority of which who didn't, who didn't, you know, participate in the attack. But nonetheless, you can easily see how people can get swept up. But, but Mo, in terms of the companies uh, like Facebook or Google or Twitter, I mean, if you take Facebook, Facebook earned over $80 billion last year, $80 million, $24 billion in, in net profits, Mo. This is not just, this, they have a user base of 3.5 billion people. So this is not just the largest company like in the history of humanity. It's easily the most sophisticated you know, advertising platform in the history of capitalism. I mean, there's just never been anything like it before. And so while they have invested heavily in innovation and they're investing heavily in acquiring new companies like an Instagram or a WhatsApp or an Oculus, and they're investing in their tech, they have got to invest in the issue of user safety. It has got to be prioritized in the same way as the next feature or some additional functionality on Facebook Messenger. Like, honestly, I'm glad they're, you know, I understand and I'm glad if their shareholders think it's smart for them to invest in I was reading this week, like drone technology. I, I suppose that makes sense in some universe. I'd like them to invest in fighting hate on their platform. I'd like to see them do as much. And just so we understand each other, be transparent about it. You know, it is not enough to say, and I've had these conversations with Facebook executives, and it is insufficient, in my opinion, to say, well, our AI catches 97% of the hate we take down. That's the latest stat. I mean, I used to be an executive at Starbucks, Mo. We didn't get to say 97% of our beverages don't contain poison. So we think we're pretty good. We never got to say that. In the rest of the business world, if your product is killing people or at least poisoning them, you take your product off the shelf and you fix it before you put it back up. And then you have to be public and release the information in your annual report about what you did. We need to understand a numerator and a denominator so we can assess 
what's going on here. So there's a set of steps they could take, Mo, all the companies to be more transparent, to be more forthright, and to help us as consumers, all as consumers, let alone people like Margaret and myself, who are whatever you would call us, like, like activists or watchdogs, to know that they are actually complying with the same kind of standards of decency and the same kinds of behaviors that all of the companies abide by. You know, Mo, I was um, struck just... by your, your question as a parent, um, because the last year has actually been an incredible challenge for us. We've seen 70 million children move their learning online, which means they're spending time online frequently not observed by parents or caregivers. And we're not sure what they're finding while they're ostensibly learning uh, from home. We've also seen an increasing isolation of families, of children, of individuals because of the pandemic. And so it has been a situation that has really lent, I think, a lot of opportunity to these extremist groups to try to recruit. One of the things that we've done in response is we've partnered with the polarization and um, the polarization and extremism research innovation lab at American University. We put out a guide for parents and caregivers on how to monitor and support your children if you're concerned that they may be being exposed to extremist ideologies. It gives you tips for what you can look for. It encourages you to ask questions and to actually seek counsel from a wide range of people who can help, including schools who may not be engaging with students on a day-to-day basis, but who could still help with some of the radicalization concerns that we're seeing across the country. Oh, I was just gonna say, Mo, you were asking, you know, what what can be done? And I I think that, um, you know, I recently wrote a story that gets at the point that you were making about the difference between sort of traditional hate or terrorist organizations and how you, you know, if if you're a member of ISIS, you sort of formally pledge your allegiance to ISIS and you are, you know, ISIS was very overt in their propaganda and that made it, for lack of a better term, easy for these companies to spot ISIS content. And so this story was comparing the work that they did on the foreign terrorist front to the work that they're doing on the domestic terrorist front. And I spoke with executives at Facebook, uh, including the guy who leads their account terrorism and domestic and dangerous organizations work and he said you know yes i i gr- agree with with jonathan uh, that that there just needs to be you know an, an equal investment in this but i also take the point that i hear from facebook executives which is that you know where do we draw the line with for instance, an ideology like QAnon that is not uh, necessarily rooted in overt hate, but obviously leads to violence and uh, and and is so disparate and and diffuse. And um, you know, do you when you when you say you're going to ban QAnon from Facebook, what does that mean? Does that mean that you're banning QAnon groups? Does it mean you're banning an individual who likes an event, likes a post about QAnon or who, you know, signs up to attend an event? How how strict are you in banning that? Um, and that does get into really um, tricky questions for these companies. For instance, when they when they banned Alex Jones and, and named him a dangerous organization on Facebook, Facebook essentially rewrote their rules. This came out in, I believe, BuzzFeed reporting, uh, rewrote their rules so that, you know, people who praised Alex Jones would not get kicked off the platform. However, if you praised uh, an Al-Qaeda leader, if you praised an, an ISIS leader, you you would be kicked off the platform. So there are they're writing these rules as they go, as they as they deal with these domestic uh, hate leaders um, and their adherence. They're they're writing new rules uh, as they go. Just a reminder to the audience. Um, uh, we're going to be moving to your questions fairly soon, so feel free to be uh, use the Q and A tab at the bottom of the screen to submit your question. Jonathan, you were about to make. Yeah, a I think I think Issy makes a good point, and I do think the companies do ask these questions about where do we draw the line, and the nature of user generated content. I mean, the reason why we have Wikipedia and Yelp, let alone Facebook, and everything else, is because people can contribute. I think for me, Issy, and I think a place where we try to understand what we'd want them to do. I think at a minimum. I think they should not be algorithmically amplifying this kind of content. So, so, so I have two thoughts. My first thought is the issue of amplification. I think it's been well documented by people like Tristan Harris and the social dilemma 
and Roger McNamee and many others about how the companies use algorithms. And we know they use this to amplify content and to give you personalized content. And you might not even realize that's being done when you look at your, you know, your newsfeed on your phone per se. But the reality is, is that and there's been lots written about this. In fact, there's a piece in the markup today that talks about this issue on YouTube and how Google deals with it, where they algorithmically allow you to amplify and market essentially content to, that appeals to white supremacists and sensationalist content, which they believe drives clicks and drives engagement. And I think at a minimum, this kind of questionable content should not be algorithmically amplified. That shouldn't be hard. Again, you wouldn't, and if I watch um, cable television or whatever, primetime, free broadcast television, like you don't put the, the horrible murder programs on in the eight o'clock hour, where again, like the kids can see them. So number one, I think algorithmic amplification is not free speech. It's a commercial tactic. And we, it needs to be severely, considerably looked at by the regulators because it's, it's kind of like, you know, a weapon of mass disinformation, right? It's a product that has terrible repercussions. I think this, this, that's number one. And I think it's really important. The second thing I would just say is that uh, none of this content should be monetizable, right? That's another thing that the companies can do. The idea that they profit off of this, I think is unconscionable and would not be hard to solve as well. This is why we launched the Stop Pay for Profit Coalition last year. Cable and a bunch of other groups. Mo is to make sure that these guys aren't monetizing this because what's happening there, just so we're clear, is you know Verizon and, and Ben and Jerry's and lots of mainstream brands who provide them, you know, drive the 80 plus billion dollar revenue behemoth that is Facebook. They're subsidizing this hateful content. And then the producers of it get some revenue sharing off that. Like that's crazy. And I don't think should be allowed. So I think amplification and monetization are two things that could be done right away. Um, I guess I'll say one last thing because today is Yom HaShoah. Today is Holocaust Remembrance Day. So I think the other thing that, that they could add is context. Contextualization would help. So like you need to know when you see Alex, that Alex Jones you know, isn't exactly Brian Williams when he shows up, you know, in your, in your stream. So we've seen like Amazon, if you, if you go search for um, Mein Kampf, there's a disclaimer on there. So, so all these companies could easily use kind of verification models to contextualize the content. If you want to put up Alex Jones or you want to put up QAnon, at least it should be the kind of warning labels that we see on cigarettes, the kind of warning labels we see on other products who, that can, that, you know, can be used that, that have, negative consequences. And I think warning labels for consumers are the minimum that these guys could do. So amplification, contextualization, and monetization are three, three levers that could be pulled that would help clean things up dramatically. We're going to start bringing students on screen in a moment to ask their questions. But we did receive one question uh, online um, that, uh, that I'm going to read because I think it it flows well from this. Look, a lot of the conversation, a lot of the context of the discussion as we all follow it is about sort of regulation, right, of, of the tech industry. What sort of policies should they be taking? You know, should there be legislation or regulation uh, forcing some of these issues? Should we make them legally liable, et cetera? But we received a question from a student by the name of, uh, I, I believe it's pronounced Shana, um, who asks, are whole of society approaches being considered? How are the public policy and tech sectors collaborating with leaders in public opinion and grassroots campaigns who are already working on this issue? I'd also throw in, you know, educators, you know, higher ed, uh, uh, school districts, uh, journalists. Talk a little bit about whether or not there is any sort of collaboration happening amongst all these different sectors. And since we're talking about hate online, how engaged is the tech, are the tech companies with these other sectors in addressing some of these? 
Well, I know you want to give it a shot. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I know that, you know, some of the groups on the call, SPLC and ADL, you know, have are are constantly pushing these companies and in conversation. I think to the first point I was making, it's just how quickly do the companies respond to all of this guidance that they are getting? It's not that they don't have a lack of guidance. They just have a lack of acting on that guidance or 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 coming to the right decision about how to act on that guidance. Um, You asked about educators. I also recently wrote a story about um, the way tech platforms deal with the research community. And this is a really hairy topic because on one hand, you have these companies that have gotten in so much trouble for privacy, for for data leaks and privacy issues. You think Cambridge Analytica, that started with a a professor at Cambridge University, right? Um, So since then, they have just both for their own um, selfish purposes, but also for, you know, to protect in a lot of ways, the privacy of their users, they have just really held, held an iron grip on data, which makes it very hard to study from the civil society what is happening on these platforms. So you have to take, as Jonathan was saying, you have to take the, these scraps of these metrics that they give us um, at face value. Well, we don't take them at face value, but that's it's what we get, right? Um, and they get into, into squabbles with, um, with a lot of researchers who try to circumvent their rules. So there are researchers at NYU trying to um, use a, a browser extension to scrape data from people who agree to install this browser extension. And Facebook has basically served them with a cease and desist, saying that this violates our policies, which it does. But should it? Should they create some kind of new lane for researchers? Like that's an ongoing conversation that I think is going to be really important because, um, you know, these companies are, to their credit, uh, creating a lot more partnerships with researchers, but it's on their terms. So they will invite the researchers in and they say, you can work with our data analysts, but our people are the only ones who will actually see the data. You'll be able to write the report, but we have full control over the data. We have some control over the scope of the investigation. So um, I think there are a lot of researchers who understandably aren't comfortable with that setup. So um, there is, they're, they're definitely making more gestures to the research community than they have in the past. I think partly because they have to, because they know that it's in their best interest to, to appear um, transparent, um, but they, they have a long way to go. And um, that's gonna be an area where you continue to see these, these uh, companies butting heads. Maybe I'll just add a a couple of thoughts. Um, One is that um, Facebook has made some moves first by hiring Laura Murphy, um, who did uh, an audit of their work and to look at their civil rights and human rights impact and the the standards they need to put in place. And they've just recently hired Roy Austin to come in as a vice president to look at issues of diversity and, and rights protection. And these are these are really good steps that they're thinking about people who can really help them uh, assess things. But these are just a few people, <laughs> and Facebook is an enormous giant. Um, and I think it just sort of underscores what Jonathan was saying earlier that those are good moves, but they're really just tentatively dipping their toes in the water, and we need to see a lot more investment. The one other thing I'll share is that the Southern Poverty Law Center um, produces an annual year in hate list of groups, extremist groups across the country that have been active in the last year. And this list, interestingly, was adopted by Amazon as the list that it uses to consult with on what charities can receive donations from its SMILE program. This was not our advocacy that did this. This is something they did on their own. Um, and we've recently had some discussions with the company because they, they're they now interested in seeing how the data that we're producing could be altered to better meet their needs. And our recommendations have been, well, well, you actually have a lot more resources. You could create your own structure to do this that would meet your needs perfectly because you would set it up. So I, I think it's interesting that they're opening these conversations. And I think it's a signal, as Issy has noted, that they recognize they have to make some changes. But it's also quite striking at, at how clumsy it still is. And, and we're hoping that we'll see a little bit more investment in this as we go forward. The, the only thing I'll add to, on that is to the question, you know, I do think we need whole of society strategies to solve this problem, though. 
It can't just be SPLC and ADL. Like that's crazy. So federal, the federal government has a role to play to tackle extremism, both the executive branch and Congress, prioritizing and then resourcing to the threat, speaking in a clear and cogent voice, you know, purging law enforcement and military from, you know, extremists. Um, Congress has introduced a new bill today, the No Hate Act, which I think is really important. But again, I think the business community also has a role to play. By the way, not just the social media companies. I mean, the social media companies, they're but one chain, you know, one link in the value chain, right, of commerce. Like the payment providers have a role to play. And as, as Margaret pointed out, you know, in so many words, like the, the, the e-commerce companies have a role to play. And like when we did Top 8 for Profit, we launched that campaign, Mo, we didn't have a single company lined up. Within three weeks, we had over 1,200 of the biggest brands in the world. They have a role. They can use their advert. They can vote with their advertising budgets. So companies, and then finally, civil society has a role to play, not just the watchdogs. I would suggest academia should be studying this. I would suggest houses of worship could step up. And, and lastly, philanthropy. I think this sector and this body of work, Mo, is chronically underfunded by philanthropy. But if we believe, as I do, that philanthropy is sort of the risk capital of society, some smart, thoughtful risks, making some bets could identify and help, help identify and reveal potential strategies to tackle this problem. And as you get proof of concept, then government can come into others and scale what works. So I, I think we, it's gonna take all of us, literally all of us, if we really wanna make a dent in this issue. All right, let's start bringing in some more student questions. When I call your name, um, you will be live. Introduce yourself, tell us your name your school year or Georgetown affiliation uh, and where you're zooming in from. So our first question comes from Eric. Uh, my name is Eric Schultz. Um, thank you for letting me speak today. Um, I am a master's student in the um, cyber risk, uh, cybersecurity risk management program. I'm almost done um, for my research um, thesis capstone project. I will actually be doing this topic in particular, um, extremism formed by online radicalization. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you. So I just, I had a, I had a question. Um, I've seen things, you know, evolve a bit over the course of the presidential election. And um, after we saw people being deplatformed after the insurrection of the Capitol, many of these individuals moved to encrypted chat rooms which make it harder for law enforcement and also watchdog groups to monitor them. Um, I'm curious how your reaction is to sort of Facebook's approach of providing disclaimers um, to the information that is allowed on their platform. If that, I know that was mentioned previously. Do you think there should be more of that? Um, do you think that's adequate um, or should there be just complete um, deplatforming of the most extreme views? Thank you for the question, Eric. Are you talking about the disclaimers like we saw around the election where they would say, you know, the results of the election are not final yet or something like that? Yeah, I've had that question myself because what I wanted to know when these companies rolled out their disclaimers as their big election integrity effort was, well, what evidence do you have that these disclaimers do anything? I mean, we've been, you know, if you like me use these platforms, you run across these disclaimers all the time now. They're on all of their COVID-19, anything you post about COVID-19, there's a, a little disclaimer at the bottom. I don't know how often most of us are clicking through or really still paying attention to that. Now they will cite these gigantic numbers as to the number of people who visit their election information center, or their COVID, and tech, COVID information center. Um, but obviously the scale of these companies is such that even very large numbers can still be a small fraction of their community. Um, so I've had that same question myself. And they, um, that is something that I mentioned, the, the research that Facebook is undertaking with some outside um, academics. Um, there are a number of academics studying Facebook's impact on the 2020 election. And I'm really hoping that that is part of their, their findings and part of their research is um, what impact did these disclaimers have on the people who saw them? Did, did they ignore them? Did they um, did they, you know, did it diminish in their view, whatever the original post was, um, because they saw a disclaimer? I just don't think we have the evidence to know what, how effective they are yet. 
That's really interesting, Essie. Thanks for sharing about the research that's being undertaken. I have to say, Eric, my sense is disclaimers might be a useful response to misinformation or the spreading of disinformation. It is not a response to hate and extremist ideology. Um, and I think, so I think there are distinctions to be made. I would advocate that you, you should be deplatforming people who are calling for hate or for violence um, and, and are espousing uh, extremist ideology. That, that's not something you can disclaim. It, it's a different, a different problem that you're trying to tackle. Okay, Eric, thanks for the question. Uh, next up, we've got a question from Miriam. Miriam, go ahead and introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for speaking tonight. I really enjoyed the discussion so far. Um, my name is Miriam. I'm a graduate student in the Master of Science in Foreign Service uh, program at Georgetown. Um, so I had a question about sort of the international aspect of combating these issues, um, asking, you know, how can countries support each other um, in, in combating this? Um, I think, as we all know, extremist ideas spread quite easily over the Internet. So are there any sort of international initiatives uh, in combating this or is it mainly a domestic effort? Um, I'll take this and, or start at least and others can jump in. So yeah, look, uh, Mark, I think Miriam, you're raising, the issue you're raising is right. I mean, we see white supremacy as a global terror threat. There were white supremacists marching from Europe, marching in Charlottesville in 2017 at the Unite the Right rally. We've had American white supremacists doing, going to rallies and doing training in Europe. We know the Christchurch shooter who murdered 50 plus Muslims in two mosques in New Zealand uh, a few years ago, cited Dylan Roof, the murderer, you know, the white supremacist who murdered parishioners in a black church in South Carolina in 2015. And I could, we could go on with these links. And the cross-pollination that's happened online is also real. I mean, social media connects many of us across cultures and time zones and languages, but it's also enabled these people to find one another and to spread their hateful ideology. Um, I can tell you that uh, there's definitely both work being done at the government policy level, at the government side, and on the nonprofit side or civil society. On the government side, uh, look, I know the security agencies work together on these issues to try to thwart attacks. And increasingly, regulators in Europe in particular are starting to bring pressure down on Facebook and Google and Twitter on this issue specifically. And it's very frustrating to them because the companies have offices overseas, Miriam, but they're sales offices. That's what they do there. They try to sell into those markets and get advertising and expand their user base. They typically are not so great on complying with policy and whatnot. So that's beginning to change. And I know that, again, U.S. and European government agencies in particular, because we've been involved in some of those conversations, are working together. And the civil society side. There's a lot of collaboration going on. I know we've got a great partnership with a group in the UK called the Institute for Strategic Dialogue that does some really good work. We're working with researchers in other parts of Europe as well. I'm, I'm gonna guess Margaret and the SPLC is doing the same. And so there's, there's a lot more collaboration happening now than before because we realize we're really all in this together. Miriam, thanks so much for the question. Uh, let's go next to William. Uh, thanks uh, for the uh, for the opportunity to uh, to uh, talk with you. Um, my name is uh, William Costanza. I'm a uh, adjunct professor uh, in the Security Studies program, and I teach a course uh, called "Crossing the Line: uh, Treason, Terrorism, and Betrayal," and it sort of looks at uh, psychological backgrounds of individuals who become um, involved in. Individuals have become threats to U.S. national security. And in part of that course, uh, the terrorism course, I look at radicalization. And, um, and uh, a part of that is right-wing uh, radicalization. I was an intelligence officer for about 25 years and did counterterrorism overseas and, and um, actually did my doctorate at, at, at Georgetown looking at radicalization. And um, my basic question, and I probably have a follow-on, hopefully, um, is that, um, you know, we're looking at two groups of people. If you're talking about, for example, right-wing um, uh, hate groups uh, that are foreign-based as opposed to right-wing hate groups that are domestic-based, and you're talking about speech, sp speech protections are different for each of those groups. So how, how do we sort of um, 
negotiate that in terms of, you know, having an approach to dealing with uh, the free speech issue? Do, do companies, what's their policy towards, you know, speech by foreign-based uh, right-wing hate groups as opposed to domestically-based right-wing hate groups? If that makes sense. Uh, maybe I could take the start of this and then pass it over to Margaret. So again, I mentioned before today is Yom HaShoah, the Day of Holocaust Remembrance. You know, countries in Europe like Germany in particular and France and some others have very strict laws, you know, uh, Professor, about things like, you know, Holocaust denialism and the companies to be in compliance with the local laws actually don't permit Holocaust denialism on their on the French versions, on the French versions of their services. So while sure you could probably VPN and access you know, go through their firewalls, if you will, and access a foreign version of their service. You can't do that. They have to do that, William, or they face significant fines and legal repercussions. Um, here in the United States, again, you could have foreign actors here, but they have to abide by our laws as it relates to the First Amendment. But again, I think what we also should just keep in mind is that companies are not public spaces. Private companies are not public spaces. So the rules that apply, if I stand you know, in, in DuPont circle, like if, if you go into a Starbucks, William, and you start screaming at the customers, go back to some country, or I think Jews are evil or whatnot, the manager of the Starbucks, they will throw you out because it isn't a free speech zone, so to speak. It isn't a public place. And the same thing would happen at any business. And our view is that, again, these companies, again, which are not public spaces, should, we can argue whether they should be classified that way, but they're not. They should abide by the same kind of norm, rules and norms that other companies do and not permit that kind of stuff on their platform. Or if they have to do it, again, like Steve Huffman says, take the fringe and keep it on the fringe rather than put it you know, in the forefront. I actually wondered if Issy wanted to add to that because I know Issy, you were talking a little bit about that earlier. Well, thank you, Margaret. Yes, I'm actually glad you brought that up, William, um, because Jonathan's right that these platforms are, are not bound by the First Amendment. They do have the right to kick anybody off. But you, I don't know if you would or wouldn't be surprised to know how much they adhere to these foreign terrorist organization designations that governments make, right? I spoke with YouTube um, for that story that I was doing about domestic versus foreign terrorist groups. And they were saying, you know, we are only ban content at the content level. In other words, we look at the video. Does the video violate our policies? Yes or no. If it does, we you know issue a strike on that video. But it's not about the speaker. It's not about who I am, the YouTube user. The only people who are banned at the speaker level are people who are on the foreign terrorist organization list. And so you might see where that is a challenge in combating domestic extremism because in the United States, because of the First Amendment, we do not have as aggressive uh, sort of labeling of domestic extremists, domestic terrorists. And so when these companies, despite their liberties to, uh, to take more liberties than the government would, um, they still are adhering pretty closely to these government lists. Now, I think that that is changing and evolving as um, I think somebody pointed out that, you know, as we got closer to the 2020 election, they were taking a lot more action on domestic extremist groups, labeling them as dangerous organizations or taking action on, on all QAnon content. I think that is evolving, but I think what you've seen for a while is to give themselves a little bit of a cover. They are relying on these lists, both from the U.S. government and from, from you know, international organizations, the U.N., um, things like that. So I think that's where you see them um, using the government as a bit of a shield. Okay, William, thanks for the question. Uh, we're getting close to the end here. I want to try to squeeze in a couple more students. Um, let's bring back Jenny, um, who introduced us all. Jenny? Yes, hi, everyone. Hello again. Um, so my question is about normalizing um, hate. So QAnon has been using aesthetics to appeal to more women, known as pastel QAnon. And I'm wondering how... Um, what, what can platforms do to address this? And has, has this changed the role of women in spreading hate online? That's a fascinating question. And actually I didn't know about pastel QAnon, so I'm learning stuff here too. Um, thanks, Jenny. I, I, I would just know one of the things we've started in the last couple of years is we've, we've started doing research on 
the intersections between misogyny and um, frankly, violence against women and the hate groups that we monitor. And we're actually seeing quite consistently that there is uh, an extraordinary overlap. Most of the leaders that we have documented as being leaders of various uh, hate groups and, and extremist ideologies are also people who have had a history of domestic or intimate partner violence um, against women and who have uh, you know, advocated misogynistic views. So I think I think they're going to have a very hard time uh, recruiting women over the long term because of those views. At the same time, we certainly saw a lot of women involved in the insurrection on January 6th. We know that women have been involved in many of the hate groups that we've tracked. We have a podcast uh, that the SPLC has started called Sounds Like Hate, and we actually document the story of a woman who tried, who has tried to leave uh, her connections with an extremist group and with a partner who was part of that group. And it's quite difficult. So I, I think um, that's an area where, frankly, we don't have a lot of research. We don't have a lot of information. And it's something we're going to be taking a lot closer look at as we go forward. OK, Jenny, thanks for the question. Um, and we probably have time for one more. So um, let's call up uh, Yabin. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Yabin, go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. Uh, this is really informative. My name is Yabin Wan. I'm a current junior in the SFS, majoring in international politics. And I, I think it's a good segue, actually, research male supremacists on ma mainstream social media. Um, so something that I wanted to ask today is because the event kind of circles around online extremism is that you know, in terms of the hate groups that we're seeing today, though there are groups like incels, which I study, which is wholly online, many of these hate groups have in-person elements and the online social media accounts that they use are like one of the many tools that they have in their arsenal to broadcast their hate. And so in terms of preventing and combating these extremist ideologies, the first question I have is, you know, is there a semantic and meaningful difference differentiating between online and offline or in-person extremism? And how does that, if there is or if there isn't, how does that change our approach to these different hate groups and how we ought to not only, um, I guess, interact with internet stakeholders, but also these hate groups themselves? Uh, I'll maybe take, take a shot and open it up to my colleagues. I think it's, yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting point. I think for, for an older generation that grew up with dial, that remembers dial-up modems, there seems to be a distinction between online and offline. But for a, a younger generation, they're, they're, they are one in the same. It's simply a part of our life. And you know, whether or not you're interacting face-to-face -face like, like we are now, or you know, avatar to avatar, or you know, sitting down in a room across from one another, it's, it, they're all in interaction. So I think you're correct. I also think it's worth pointing out that we've watched, again, groups like ADL and SPLC for years, extremists are early adopters of technology, right? So they were on bulletin board systems, you know, 30 years ago. And then they moved on to AOL when that was a thing, for those who remember that. And today, you know, we're finding examples of them on Clubhouse or on Substack. So let alone in gaming environments or in other media. So I think we need to, if we want to really understand the problem, let alone deal with it, we need to be as adept and as agile in watching how they are using different inputs and different modalities to try to mainstream their content and remain hyper vigilant. Because you just can't, we can't afford to take our eye off the ball. Because again, you know, the online and the offline are the same. And, you know, there are plenty of proofs of concepts of that. Names that have already been mentioned on this call from Dylan Roof to William Bowers, who, you know, was responsible for the massacre at the Tree of Life synagogue to so many others. They leave, they don't leave digital breadcrumbs or digital manifestos. They're just breadcrumbs and manifestos. And so the, we can't afford to think that we have the luxury of, oh, that's only online or that, Substack isn't really a thing. They are all of a piece and we've got to be hyper vigilant about all of it. And, and I think one thing you're starting to see is the platforms 
um, recognizing that they have to take into account what happens in the real world as well off their platforms. And so uh, you're starting to see them take action based on things that are happening, not on Facebook or not on YouTube or Twitch or Snap, um, but what's happening out in the real world. Um, but then it, it has to work the other way too, right? Like I think of the the, diff, the the distinction here is whose shoulders does it rest on to investigate and to find and to root out? Um, so for a long time, the companies have been sort of the, the watchdogs for their own platforms because nobody else can see in. But we see what happens then is groups like the FBI miss that the Proud Boys are really a risk worth taking seriously. Facebook and Twitter had banned the Proud Boys in 2018. What we know now is leading up to the January 6th insurrection, the FBI wasn't taking them as seriously as even Facebook and Twitter. And so we certainly don't want that to be the case. So um, as much as I'm a little squeamish about companies cooperating too closely with law enforcement, um, I think that you do want want them sending some signals to each other so that um, one hand is, is talking to the other. I think I'll just add one last point, and that is ultimately, as Jonathan highlighted earlier, it's the government's responsibility to really think about an overarching strategy and a whole society approach to, to this challenge. What we've seen over the last year, few, several years, is that the federal government was not taking up its responsibilities. It doesn't just sit with the federal government. State and local governments have as much obligation and responsibility as the federal government does as well. But we really need to see that leadership. And I've been heartened by the fact that the Biden administration came in and made this a priority from day one to really look across the federal government, to look at all agencies, to understand the threats. And we are expecting to see some additional steps from the White House in the next few months. Uh, Yevon, thanks for your question. Um, and unfortunately, we could, we're out of time. We could keep this conversation going for much, much longer. Um, Jonathan and Margaret, you are both very, very busy individuals. I am sorry that you are so busy, um, given um, what you're fighting. Um, but uh, your advocacy is inspiring. So thank you both for, for being part of this. Issy, thank you for being with us tonight um, and helping us make sense of an industry that is evolving so rapidly that they have trouble keeping pace with themselves um, and, and, and tracking all the changes. So thank you for helping provide that important context. And I wanna thank everyone who joined us tonight for sharing part of your evening with us. Um, Please stay tuned for other programming from the Institute. Um, on Monday night uh, at 5.30, we'll be hosting a conversation with Congresswoman Liz Cheney on the future of the Republican Party and the conservative movement. And then the next night on Tuesday, we'll be hosting a conversation with Chris Krebs, uh, the former director of the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, who was the chief government. Um, uh, he was in charge of, of election security in the 2020 election uh, and obviously made quite a bit of news in that role uh, where we'll be talking about election security and protecting against cyber threats. That's Tuesday at 5.30. And uh, you can always follow us at GU Politics uh, to keep pace and keep track of other upcoming programming as we uh, approach the end of the semester. For all those of you who tuned in um, online um, on the social media platforms that we spent so much time talking about tonight, thank you. Um, and uh, we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.